Hello and welcome to the 15th lecture in my series on understanding science. This is a bonus lecture in addition to the 14 previous lectures which formed the main part of my course. In this particular lecture I'm going to talk a bit more about random noise and how randomness can sometimes be incredibly misleading. I'm going to expand on the work I covered in lecture 13 and I'm also going to add a lot more information and an accompanying spreadsheet which you can use to follow along if you have access to Microsoft Excel. You don't need to download the spreadsheet as I'll be showing screenshots in the presentation but it might be useful for you to play with the ideas I'm going to introduce so that you get a better understanding of what's going on. For those who want to take a look the link is shown in the notes to this video and is also shown at the relevant point in the video itself. So let's get started. What do we actually mean by randomness? In science and in mathematics we talk of random variables which are generally things that we can measure that vary in an unpredictable way. Lots of things in life are essentially random, from a fair coin toss to rolling a six-sided die to spinning a roulette wheel. Of course, in each of those cases, it should be possible to work out what the result will be ahead of time if you have sufficiently accurate measurements of the physical processes involved. A robot, for example, should be able to throw a coin so that it always ends up heads. But humans generally can't predict anything so complex, so the results are essentially random to us. Here are some examples of common random processes that we see in science and everyday life. Radioactive decay is perhaps the most well known. The chance of an atom decaying radioactively can be calculated extremely accurately, but all we ever have is that probability. We never know exactly which atom will decay and when it will decay, because the laws of physics underlying radioactive decay are inherently probabilistic. That's to say that, unlike classical situations we mentioned earlier like flipping a coin, even if you have all the information that's available, you take every single possible measurement you can, it's impossible to tell when it will decay. This is truly a random process. Astronomical events are often random in a different way. There are so many stars in each galaxy and so many galaxies in the universe that even extremely rare events like supernovae, massive stars exploding, and gamma ray bursts happen quite often across the universe. But we don't know exactly when or where they will occur except perhaps for stars very close to us where we can estimate the star's mass and work out roughly how long it has left to live. As galaxies are spread roughly evenly across the sky, distributions of supernovae should be expected to be randomly distributed across the sky too. In fact, this is one way astronomers were able to tell that gamma ray bursts, which are enormous explosions that we know very little about, they were able to tell that they weren't events in our own galaxy because once they pinpointed enough of them, it became obvious that they were spread across the entire sky and not just concentrated in places where our galaxy's stars are densest. Genetic mutations are also largely a random process, though it's known that some parts of the genome are more susceptible to mutations than others, and we know some effects, such as high-energy radiation, that do enhance mutation rates. Similarly, meteorology contains much randomness. Though we can predict general trends in climate over longer timescales, the weather patterns on our planet are inherently chaotic and therefore almost impossible to predict accurately over any lengthy timescale. So given that so many physical processes are inherently random, understanding how randomness works is the key to avoiding some really common mistakes. Not just simple things like measurement errors, but also understanding when an unusual result is actually significant and when it can just be written off as noise. At this point, if you're interested in following along, please download the accompanying spreadsheet at the URL listed below. You might want to pause this video while you get it loaded up. It's not vital to have this spreadsheet though, so if you just want to watch the video, that's perfectly okay. So, let's do a recap on statistical significance. For more detail, see Lecture 13 in my series on Understanding Science, where I go into this topic in much more detail. For now, let's just remind ourselves of the key points that you'll need to know. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, randomness often looks non-random to humans. We're pattern-finding creatures. We spot patterns and regularities because that's given us an evolutionary advantage over time. Those creatures that can spot patterns in weather or hunting patterns of their natural predators can do much better than those who can't. But sometimes we see patterns that aren't really there because it's always better to be safe than sorry. As the old story goes, it's better to run away from a rustle in the bushes only to find out it was just the wind than it is to ignore the rustle and get eaten by a hiding tiger. Secondly, unlikely events do occur. This seems like a really obvious thing to say, but people do win the lottery. People fall out of aircraft without a parachute and survive. You can't count on it, of course, but it does occasionally happen. Thirdly, and this is where it gets a bit technical, but I'll spare you the details, 
we can understand randomness using statistical models. The most common one that you may have heard about is the Gaussian model, which is used to model pretty much everything from subatomic processes right up to things you'll notice in the world around you, like distributions of height. The mean is a measure of the average value in a data set, such as the average height. And the standard deviation is a measure of how much people tend to vary from this average. If the distribution of heights has, say, a mean of 170 centimetres and a standard deviation of 10 centimetres, then the average person is 170 centimetres. That doesn't, of course, mean that everyone is that height, but it means the average is approximately that. The standard deviation of 10 centimetres means that roughly two-thirds of people are within 160 to 180 centimetres, or one standard deviation, and roughly 95% are within two standard deviations, or between 150 and 190 centimetres. Finally, one last idea. The term statistically significant really means statistically unlikely. This is a slightly nuanced topic, but essentially, when you're looking at a result and someone says it's statistically significant, what they're really saying is that the chance of that result coming about by chance alone is very small. The exact value of very small can be tuned depending on how much confidence you want to have in the claim. So if someone says that they have a fair coin and then you flip it ten times and get ten heads, by pretty much any description that's a statistically significant result, and it tends to suggest that the coin isn't a fair coin, it's biased. It doesn't prove it, of course, because it's perfectly possible to flip ten heads in a row on a fair coin. It's just very unlikely. Right, let's get into the new material. And if you're following along on the spreadsheet, take a look at the first tab called Random Walk. The Random Walk is a very important concept because so much is built off it, including, with some modification, a huge fraction of models that banks use for modelling stocks and shares, plus models that chemists use to investigate diffusion, models that astrophysicists use to examine the centres of stars, and models that biologists use to predict the spread of living creatures from bacteria to herds of bison. The simplest example of this model is as follows. Start by imagining a long, narrow alleyway running from left to right. Somewhere in the middle of this alleyway is a pub door, which opens and outsteps a very drunk man. Now this man is so drunk that he staggers randomly down the alleyway. Half the time he'll stagger to the left, and half the time he staggers to the right. And the direction of each step is unrelated to the direction of the previous one. He has no aim, and he's so drunk he can't even tell which way he's going. What will the path he takes look like? Well, if you look at the spreadsheet, or the diagram on this slide, which shows a screen capture from that spreadsheet, you'll see some examples. If you have the spreadsheet, your graph will look different to mine, and you can regenerate a totally new graph by hitting F9, which causes the calculation to refresh. That's the F9 key. The graph is built using a random walk model, which generates new random numbers each time you refresh the page. So in this model, we start at zero, and 50% of the time a step moves up, totally at random, and 50% of the time also totally at random, it moves us back down. Over time, we do move gradually further away from zero on average, but if you keep hitting F9, then you'll notice that the graphs are just as likely to end up above the horizontal axis as they are to end up below it. This is because the operations we perform, that's plus one or minus one, are exactly equally likely to happen, so there's no bias to moving up or down. This, of course, means that either is just as likely to happen. But what happens when we do add a bias? Well, let's look at that next. So if you flip to the second sheet in your Excel workbook, or take a look at the diagram below, you'll notice something a bit different. Imagine our original picture of a drunk man staggering down an alleyway. Now imagine that there was a slight breeze flowing down the alleyway in one direction. So in this model, I've added a slight bias to the direction the drunk man walks. He's either slightly more likely to move right than left, or the opposite. You should be able to see the bias value in cell D2 in the spreadsheet. This can go between 0 and 1, and it represents the probability in the graph of moving upwards instead of downwards. So if you set that at exactly 0.5, then up and down are exactly as likely as each other. With a value of 0, it will always move down, and 1 will always move up, and then any value between those limits will be some combination. The first thing to note is that even with a bias, sometimes the graph will go against the bias. If you change the bias to 0.55, for example, which means it's slightly more likely to go up than down, and then keep hitting F9 to refresh, you'll notice that most of the time the graphs all end up above the axis, but sometimes they don't. You can change the bias back down towards 0.5, say 0.51, so slightly above, and even that small bias will definitely change the outcome. You'll see more graphs above zero than below. 
And similarly, if you change it to just below 0.5, say 0.49, then you'll see slightly more below than above. Let's move on so we can talk about what this actually means and how we might use such a model in the real world. So far we've just talked about random walks in a fairly abstract way, looking at graphs and discussing random processes. But where can we actually see examples of this theory in nature? Well the best examples are all very well known. Brownian motion is an excellent example. You may have seen it yourself, and in fact it's a phenomenon that was first explained by none other than Albert Einstein in a famous paper in 1905 which was the same year he also came up with special relativity and explained something called the photoelectric effect. Brownian motion happens when you have a scattering of extremely tiny particles, for example pollen grains, on the surface of a dish of water. If you look very carefully, you'll notice that the particles dance around, seemingly at random, despite the fact that no wind is blowing them. The reason for this, as Einstein proved, is that the water molecules are bashing into them, and they're doing this at completely random angles. Occasionally a few more will bash into a certain grain from the left and the right, which will cause the grain to move in one direction. The next moment it might be from another direction. Either way, the movement of these pollen grains is essentially random. Every time they move, it's in a random direction, which should, at least in a simple setup, be entirely unbiased. So over time a grain will move from its original spot, but it's equally likely to move in any direction from there, up, down, left or right. And if you replayed the same experiment a million times, a grain would more or less end up at every point in the circle, and in a range of different directions, but the average location of all of those points would be exactly where it started. It's just like the drunk in an alleyway example, except instead of one dimension, now we're working in two. Diffusion is very similar. When you release, say, a coloured dye into a liquid, it spreads or diffuses throughout the liquid, just like with Brownian motion. The particles spread out entirely symmetrically, with no bias to direction. Whereas with Brownian motion that might have been in a two-dimensional circle, with diffusion it's three dimensions, so in a sphere. Just for interest, the average distance that any molecule will diffuse is related to the square root of the time it's been diffusing for. So if you want a certain chemical to fill a tank that's twice the size, you'll have to wait for four times as long. The third example is genetic drift. Now this might not be something you've heard of, but it's a very well-studied phenomenon that occurs in isolated populations of creatures who all interbreed. The idea is really simple. Let's say that there's some trait that doesn't really have any big effect on the fitness of an individual, say the colour of their eyes. Genetic drift tells us that the proportions of the different variations of that trait will naturally change over time, as certain colours become more popular and take over large swathes of the population, but then later a different one becomes more prominent. Not for any reason, just because genetics is based, at its heart, on the random sorting of properties from both parents. If you watch the changes over time of those traits, it will meander through all the possibilities in a seemingly random manner. But there are also lots of biased random walks that you will be familiar with in your everyday life. Gambling, of course, is a good one. Have you ever played those fruit machines in a casino? You put some money in, pull the lever and see what pictures pop up on the machine in front of you. Sometimes you get a bit of money back, sometimes you get a lot of money back, but most of the time you get nothing and your balance slowly dwindles away to zero. That's a random process or at least it should be if the machine isn't cheating, but notice that it's bound to be configured so that there's a slight bias in it. You expect to win slightly less than you put in, so your balance always goes to zero in the long term. But occasionally you do get a big win, you double your money by fluke, and it seems like the odds aren't stacked against you at that point in time. So your money keeps going up and down and up and down, but over time the trend is definitely always downwards. There's a reason why casinos are always covered in gold and marble. Finally, the most obvious example of them all is evolution itself. Now, the underlying engine of evolution is largely the effect of random genetic mutations. But that's an engine that could just as easily power change backwards as forwards, so towards lower fitness rather than increasing fitness. So we also sort of need a steering wheel for that. And natural selection is the steering wheel that evolution uses to ramp up organisms to greater complexity and fitness. Natural selection looks at the randomness it's given and preferentially picks out the fittest to survive. It's the bias that takes the randomness of genetic mutations and uses it to drive evolution in the direction of increasing fitness. The idea of Brownian motion is also used in a more technical sense to model a lot of very common random processes. One of the most widely known examples is the use in finance to model stock prices. As any investor knows, stock prices can go down as well as up, and in a perfectly efficient market it should be impossible to tell which is going to happen, because any tiny shred of predictability will have been picked on by the experts and used up. 
When we model stock prices, we often use a Brownian motion model based on two components, drift and volatility. Volatility is the entirely symmetric randomness that we've been discussing, the 50% up, 50% down component. The volatility number simply controls the scale of those movements, so the higher the value, the more drastic those random movements will be. But they'll always be 50% up, 50% down. So with just this component, you would expect stock prices to keep their same average values over time. But of course that doesn't happen. We have inflation and economies grow, so over time the average stocks increase in value. If you ignore the occasional wobble, the markets always move upwards. And that's where the bias comes in. This is a constant value by which the stock price shifts upwards continuously over time. So if you turn to the third sheet in the accompanying workbook, you'll see an example of this. Bias and volatility here are measured in percentage rather than as an absolute value because we want the behaviour of stock to look roughly the same regardless of how much an individual share is worth, which really just depends on how many shares the company arbitrarily decided to divide its earnings between. But everything else is identical to the examples before, so try playing around with the values. The extremes are worth exploring. If volatility is zero, then you get an exponential growth with zero randomness. If bias is zero, then you get an unbiased random walk just like before and the values in between plot out the ground between these extremes. As before, if you hit F9, you can refresh the sheet and see lots of different instances using the same initial parameters. Those of you who've been playing around with the worksheet will now have seen the kind of behaviour that you can create with biased Brownian motion. I've provided an example here so that everyone can look at the exact same thing, and in this case I've used a small bias and a medium volatility, so you can see that the graph trends upwards, as denoted by the green line here, but that there are distinct periods where the graph does trend downwards locally, as denoted by the red arrow. This is really important to understand, because you know that this graph was created with a positive bias. That is, if you wait long enough, you know that this graph will go further and further upwards. In that period where the graph trended downwards, absolutely nothing changed about the parameters to the graph. Exactly the same processes were generating the numbers at that point as at all other points the bias was still positive. The only difference was that at that point we got a string of excessive negative numbers out of our random number generator. And shortly afterwards, this trend reversed and the graph resumed its upwards climb. That idea is really important to understand. Even in the downward section of the graph, the values were still being created by the identical random process with an upwards trend that created the rest of the graph. So I'm sure by now you can see where I'm going with all of this. Randomness, as I've said before, can be extremely misleading. Even with a positive drift, as we've seen in the last slide, the value will occasionally trend downwards if the volatility is sufficiently high to temporarily swamp the effect of the bias. The most obvious example of this is global warming. As we know, measurements of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have been increasing steadily over time. This much is absolutely undeniable, and science tells us that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere traps heat and causes global warming. This much is also absolutely undeniable, but that doesn't mean that temperatures will go upwards absolutely without fail every year in every single location. That would be impossibly unlikely. Essentially you're saying that you could build thousands of graphs like the ones we played with a few slides back where we discussed bias Brownian motion, and every single one of them should be monotonically increasing. That means it should always be going upwards. Now with the volatility were zero, or very nearly zero, that would probably be the case. But you can clearly see from most values of volatility and bias, it's very obviously never going to happen as simply as that. So, as has famously been pointed out, sometimes some measurements of global temperature appear to be standing still or even occasionally head back downwards. That definitely doesn't mean that global warming has been reversed. Just like in the spreadsheet, we know that the bias is there. And the bias in the case of global warming is caused by carbon dioxide. We know that temperatures are trending upwards over the long term. But in the short term, volatility effects such as El Nino and slight variations in the intensity of the sun will add a bit of random noise to this. But now, of course, you're wise enough not to be fooled by that. Just for clarity, here are two actual real graphs taken from the NASA website, which show measurements of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, on the top left, and the amount to which global temperatures have deviated from the long-term average, at the bottom right. If you take an exceptionally hot year, say 1998, and a later year that was a lower than expected value, say 2007 or 2010, then it looks like the trend is flat or even sloping downwards, 
but it's clear from a zoomed out view and from the values for the years that followed that the slope is very definitely pointing upwards and at an alarming rate. And it's very obvious from the CO2 measurements that the underlying bias, the force that's driving this warming, is very definitely continuing to rise. And bear in mind that the increasing levels of CO2 don't just mean the bias is positive, but that the bias is actually getting larger over time. Let's play this game another time, with an even more obvious example. Let's just generate a straight line sloping upwards, and then overlay it with some noise. This is mathematically much simpler than the previous example, and it should be obvious what we're doing here, but it's also obvious that it's still possible to find components even in this undeniably upwards trending graph where the trend goes down for a short while. You can play with this model on sheet 4 of the example workbook. In the example shown on this slide, if we zoom into the highlighted section it does indeed look like the trend has been reversed, especially if we carefully choose the values that make it look as bad as possible. Please have a play with this yourself on the Excel worksheet until you understand what's going on intuitively. There's no great value in understanding effects like this from a mathematical perspective if you don't have an intuitive understanding. A strong gut feeling for the kind of tricks that randomness can play is what will protect you against falling for the kind of propaganda and lies that are being spread as we speak by people with a huge financial vested interest in denying the reality of global climate change. So to summarise, this has been a rather special episode of my Understanding Science series, where I very definitely had a specific target in mind. I hope you found it useful. If you have, then of course please share it with as many people as you can. To summarise what we've learned, randomness can be very misleading, but learning about how this can be the case can go a long way to protecting you against misunderstanding random processes in future. Firstly, random processes don't always follow the trend that may underlie them, and sometimes they might even appear to do the exact opposite. Remember, in the graphs that we saw, the underlying processes generating the numbers never changed in these sections. All that you were seeing was the result of a string of random numbers temporarily moving downwards instead of upwards for no reason other than that they just sometimes do. Sometimes you roll three six-sided dice and get three ones. Sometimes you get three sixes. It doesn't mean the dice are loaded. It's just what randomness does. More importantly... Statistics can tell us what the unaided eye cannot. Although actually calculating statistics can often require more mathematical training than most people possess, there are always experts at hand who have done those statistical analyses and are more than happy to share them with you. As with all things, don't just listen to lone mavericks, no matter how convincing they may seem to you, when the bulk of expert opinion is against them. It's very easy to lie with statistics, but in a trained hand, they can cut through the numbers and get to the real story hiding behind the random noise. So don't be fooled by cherry-picked statistics. As I showed, you can profoundly mislead people by zooming in on an unrepresentative section of a graph, or by trying to draw conclusions from an insufficient quantity of information. Make sure you remain sceptical of claims that appear to go against the consensus, and, as always, follow the money. Often people have very specific motivations for giving a certain point of view. Finally, for more trustworthy information about climate change, make sure you check out the NASA website at the link below. Getting people all over the world to understand the vital nature of this impending disaster is the biggest challenge of our times. But it's also the biggest opportunity of our times. To invent an entirely clean and renewable power infrastructure, to build up entirely new industries, produce millions of jobs, and to come together as a human species to combat a problem that is affecting all of us. Thanks very much for listening. I'm hoping that it won't be quite such a long gap before the next video, but as ever, I'll see you next time.